evening. This is Crime Classics. I am Thomas Highland with another true story of crime. Listen. Six shots from a Colt 44. For no reason whatsoever other than to get your ear attuned to what you're going to hear. Of course, I might have said that the Colt 44 belonged to our hero, and our hero happened to be walking the field and plucking off railbirds, but he would have done that for no reason whatsoever, too. So, here we are. Our hero's name is William Bonney, a lad who was a product of his time, and whose time may be described as a blot. So tonight, my report to you on Billy Bonney, Bloodletter, also known as The Kid. Crime Classics, a series of true crime stories from the records and newspapers of every land from every time. Your host each week, Mr. Thomas Highland, connoisseur of crime, student of violence, and teller of murders. Now, once again, Mr. Thomas Highland. <laughs> William Bonney got to be 12 years old by being born in New York City in 1859 and being in Silver City, New Mexico in 1871. He was not tall for his age, but he was a smart one. Give him a pack of cards and say, Billy, let's see you deal a full house from the bottom. And the boy's nimble fingers would flip three aces and two ladies in front of you quicker and shoot with a cut snout. Or put a cue stick in his little fist, and if he didn't hit you with it, he'd run the rack. In rotation, like as not, real smart. On a sunny day, you could see him walking down the shady side of the street, whistling and handling the oddments in his little pocket. A slingshot, a pair of dice, shaved, and a knife, razor sharp. There he goes. Hi. I said hi, Mr. Garvey. I'm playing cards, Billy. Get away. I know you're playing cards, and I wish you luck. But I gotta talk to you. Skedaddle. My mother was crying this morning, Mr. Garvey. She said your name. Skedaddle. Mr. Garvey. Put that knife back in your pocket, or I'll spank you. (laughs) If you ain't the one, Billy. Now, Billy dearly loved his mother, and he couldn't stand to see her cry. A good boy. He stabbed Mr. Garvey in the chest three times. Killed him. When he went back to his mom, he told her that he taught that Mr. Garvey a thing or two, and she did this. Patted her son's tousled hair, gave him five silver dollars, and told him to get out of town. Billy did. I'd like to now pick out a couple of more highlights at random. Events in Billy's life before he was 17. Um, here's one. Morning, Mr. Carper. Morning, son. What you doing feeding my horse, Mr. Carper? Paint your horse, son. Tis. Paint. Tis. Paint. Was. Uh, here's another one. Kid. Yeah? Bet. Bet what? Like I've been saying. Bet you $25 I kill someone today before you do. You mean it? I mean it. Stack me 25 on the table and I'll stack mine. Sure. Now it's a bet, all right, ain't it? Now it's a bet. Draw. What? Hot out there in the street, I'm staying here. So I'm provoking you to draw. You're an egg sucker, Tex. Ain't no shorthorn like you gonna call me. Fifty dollars on the red. One of the outstanding events of Billy's life was the Lincoln County War. 
This was a war between two opposing factions in New Mexico, one led by Mr. Murphy, the other led by Mr. Chisholm and Mr. Max Sween. Now, Mr. Murphy had the law on his side, but Mr. Murphy and the law happened to be thieves. Mr. Chisholm and Mr. Max Sween were outside the law, but they were the good guys, and Billy the Kid was on their side. Uh, during this war, Billy killed... <laughs> Five men. The fifth man died hard. The war was never really resolved in spite of the United States Cavalry appearing at a fast trot from time to time, stopping, someone shouting forward, someone's blowing a bugle, and then trotting on again. And it was in this war that Billy grew to full stature, five foot eight. Also, his reputation as a killer, 16 men since he was 12. Also, he liked to have his tousled hair played with. What'd you say your name was? Paulita. Paulita. And you they call Billy? Yeah. Billy. Billy. Nino. Nino? Boy. Young boy. That's right. They call me Billy the Kid. Listen. What? When I see you riding through Fort Sumner, when I see you, the way you are, riding the way you do... Here is where the winds beat inside of you. Here. I've been to your country. Do you know that? Mexico? Sure. Three years ago. Killed a man in El Paso and a posse chased me clear across the border. And did you like my country? Sure. Sorry to leave it, but I had to. Okay. Killed a man in Sonora. Mexican police chased me back over to Rio Grande. Billy. Yeah? <sighs> Nino. Nino. <laughs> Many girls in Fort Sumner do as I do. Watch you as you ride by. Then they meet together and talk of you and giggle. What do they say? Close and I will tell you. <laughs> <laughs> you were doing, Paulina. Okay. To my hair. Mm. Like this? Yeah. Yeah. At the very moment that this was going on and not dreamt of by our star-crossed lovers, who couldn't read anyhow, Ben Hur was being written. The writer's name, as we all know, is Lou Wallace. He was in the area at the time, being governor and peacemaker. Ah, uh, that's that. Another chapter done. The one where Ben Hur and Marsala meet face to face and toss jibes. But the general's day is not over. I guess I'd better. More writing to be done. So the general picks up his pen, writes, and when he's finished, reads over what he's written. Dear Billy, you don't know me, but I know you. I'm your governor, and I want to see you. I've got a proposition that I think you might be interested in. Governor. Oh, hi, Billy. Had your letter read to me by my partner, Charlie Beaudry. He says you got a proposition that's interesting to me. I'm offering you amnesty, Billy. What's that? Don't wear your gun anymore, and no law is going to touch you. I killed a lot of men, Governor. I come your Just offering... Just let's start having a little peace around here, that's all. Oh, I'm for that, Governor. I've always been for that. Well, now, I'm glad to hear it. Except nobody will let me be peaceful. Well, it's going to be different now. Governor. Governor, you know what had happened I put away my gun. I'd be shot down like a dog. I could name 12 men shoot me down as soon as I see I was wearing no gun. 
There's Bob Ollinger. It's going to be different. You take Ollinger, for, for instance. He's a deputy. He works for the sheriff. He'll be wearing a gun, won't he? Yes. Yes, he would, but... He'd shoot me like a dog. How old are you, Billy? Eighteen. You got a lot of living ahead of you, son. Not without no gun. It's going to be different. You say I got a lot of living to do, and I aim to do it, Governor. Just because you say words like am... am Amnesty. Amnesty. Ain't no magic words to make me front Bob Ollinger, for instance, without no... Billy, I've got something else to offer you. What else? When all the shooting's done, when the killing's over, how'd you like to be a sheriff? Oh, oh. oh there. Look down there, Boulder. Bottom of the hill. Yeah, I see him. What you reckon they're doing? Digging, I guess. Just digging. Maybe for a water hole or something. I don't know. A man has to be crazy to be digging in this hot sun. Yeah, local. You got to admit something, Boulder. Why? I'm facing into the sun now, eh? What are you going to shoot those three fellas for? They ain't doing nothing. You admit about the sun? Sure. You betting any money they ain't dead? What would you shoot them for? For nothing at all. Because you felt like it. Because I felt like it. Get... I think it's safe to say that at this stage in his career, and until he died, Billy the Kid was a mad dog. are listening to Crime Classics and your host, Thomas Hyland. Driving tonight? Then remember this. Most highway deaths are caused by two temptations, to cut out of line and to go too fast. Crossing the center line of the road is more dangerous than you realize. Statistics prove it. Excessive speed is just as dangerous as officials say. You can predict your own impulses, but you can never predict the other drivers when driving tonight. Drive cautiously, please. And now once again, Thomas Hyland and the second act of Crime Classics, and his report to you on Billy Bonney Bloodletter, also known as The Kid. You'll recall that earlier I referred to this era and scene of American history as a blot. Well, I've been thinking it over, and I must say that blot is a good word. It was a terrible time in New Mexico, pillar and murder and looting by a breed of men who did these things with no sense of shame or remorse. This bleak country was a kind of trail's end. The spoilers came here and the buffalo killers and the gunslingers. I suppose it was as good a place as any to gather because while they were killing each other off, they couldn't break anything. There was hardly anything there. A grand piano owned by a Mrs. Max Sween early went up in smoke during the Lincoln County War. And once a stray shot shattered Mrs. Gaffney's fluted tureen. But aside from these, a clever hand could mend anything in the area with adobe or a piece of wood. You may ask then, why did all these people kill each other? My answer to you is... That's what happens in a block. But in 1880, government officials in the area received notice to clean up. Therefore, General Lew Wallace summoned one Pat Garrett. Got a paper here, Pat, from Washington. Says to clean up. Uh Uh-huh. We're going to do it, too. But we're going to need your help. I heard you used to be a friend to Billy. Billy Bonney, Pat. The kid. Uh Uh-huh. That's why I'm forgetting all the things I've heard about you. 
Probably lies, anyhow. I want you to get Billy for me. Take a look. Pretty badge, isn't it, Pat? Uh-huh. Take it. Go ahead, take it. That's the boy. Now, you just pin it on. I heard Billy's up around Fort Sumner, Pat. Headed that way, anyhow. Heard he sees a little Mexican girl who's kind of related to your wife. Uh-huh. I think you ought to go up to Fort Sumner. Take half a dozen men or so and go up there. I'm not making a mistake, am I, Pat? You are the man to take, Billy, aren't you? Uh-huh. Good luck, Sheriff. About the events which took place outside of Fort Sumner. Well, let's see how they told about it at the time. Let's see how the boys who wrote the 19th century paperbacks had at it. Ah, here's one. Written by Bledsoe Sheridan Jr. and entitled Hero in Ambush or The Daring Escape of Brave Billy Bonney. Mr. Sheridan starts out this way. Pat Garrett squinted steely eyes off into the distance. He saw six horsemen. The sheriff turned to his lieutenant and he said, Men, that is Billy, the young boy, and his desperado friends. The West will be a better place to live when he and his breed are six feet under. Get out your pistols, men, and make sure they're loaded up. You there, pick us, Bob. Get behind that boulder or else they see you. Here they come. And Bledson Sheridan Jr. goes on. The desperados came within a hundred feet of the boulders and were not aware of the ambush until... In spite of all the steely eyes that must have been on both sides of the ambush, and in spite of all the six-shooters and shotguns, there wasn't a scratch in the crowd. Brave Billy Bonney and his merry band turned tail and fled. Bledsoe Jr.'s next chapter is aptly entitled Stinking Springs, for that is where we pick up the boy. When we gonna rest, Billy? Now on the way. Then what? They're going to come after us. You know that, Baudry. I asked you. Then what? We're going to rest the stinking springs down there. Down there's a place. Cabin place. Fight it out there, Billy? You scared? You must be. You ask me a question like that. Four of us. You, me, Wilson, Pickett. How many you figure they got? That was Pat Garrett, wasn't it? What I could see it was... He can get all he wants. You scared, Billy? You're talking foolish, Bodie. Sure I am. Billy. Yeah? It's starting to snow. Yeah. One thing I'm glad about. What? Inside here ain't as cold as outside there. Bet Garrett and his boys are plenty cold. Plenty cold. Hey, Garrett! Garrett, you cold? Come on in here. It's warm. Come on out, Billy. Come get some ham and some eggs. Man, I'm hungry. Been in this place for five days. Bet you hungry too, ain't you, Wilson? Pick it. Come on in here, Garrett. Hey! Hey, Garrett! Can't come in. Stand out after you, though. <laughs> Billy! Man, I got you. Billy! It looks like. Let me see. <laughs> looks like I got you, Booger. Listen. Billy, I... Listen, Bodie. You go on out there, you hear? You're done for anyhow. You go on out there and get one of them before you die. Go on, Bodie. Just keep your coat pointing out, just like that. 
Now you get one of them, you hear? Me? Get that, Baudry? Let me take a look. Hey, Billy! Charlie Baudry's dead! Coffee's hot, Billy! Won't you come on out? Hey, Pickett Wilson, you hear me? Coffee's hot! Those are ham and eggs! Nobody's gonna hurt you, boys! All you gotta do is... Hello, Pickett. Just keep your hands way up there. You're not gonna get hurt. Hi, Wilson. Glad to see you. Come on, get some coffee for yourself. Just take his gun and feed him, boys, like we promised to do. Hey, Billy! Ain't going back to Fort Sumner, Pat. Won't take you back to Fort Sumner, Billy. Take you to Santa Fe. How's that sound to you, Billy? Santa Fe. Where? I swear, Billy. Hi, Billy. <laughs> and then you know what? <laughs> I'm going to tell you what, Billy. <laughs> You're gonna kill yourself throwing yourself against those bars. My name ain't Bob Ollinger. <laughs> <laughs> you ain't gonna cheat the rope, Billy. They found you guilty and you're gonna hang. Before I do. Before I do. <laughs> you're gonna do what? Kill me, Bob Ollinger. <laughs> <laughs> you ain't killing me. I'm making me a promise. I'm going to kill me you. <laughs> okay, Ollinger, I'll take garden now. <laughs> Explain to Billy how we're going to hang him. And watch how he does the thing. You got to watch him. He don't kill himself. <laughs> See you tomorrow, Billy. Now, you know what, Billy? That Ollinger's a man I don't like. He did a thing to me once, and I'm going to tell you about it. Tomorrow you're going to die anyhow, and you won't have a chance to tell anybody. Here was Ollinger, and here was my sister. My sister's dead now. Some people say... Billy, some people say... Billy, how'd you get my two-barrel shotgun out of my hands without me knowing it? Open her up. Where'd I get me Bob Ollinger? Room up in front where he sleeps. This time of night, guess that's where he just went. Hi, Bob. It's safe to assume that this was one of the happiest moments in Billy's life. He had killed a fellow he hated. He felt so good about it, he didn't even stop to wave ta-ta to Sheriff Pat Garrett. Just walked right out of there and drifted along down the trail. Which trail wound up across the street from Pete Maxwell's, which just happened to be Paulita's place. I love you, Billy. Paulita. I love you and worry for you. Just love me. Just don't worry about me, that's all. Billy. What? We can go to Mexico. I've been thinking that. Oh, bueno. When? When shall we go? 
When you want to. Right now. Oh, I see. See, we will go. We will go to Mako and Mari and... <laughs> you are serious? <laughs> Hungry, too. I'm going across to Maxwell. Bring us back or something other to eat. Billy. What do you want? Be careful. Dee Dee Maxwell's my friend. But be careful. Let go of me. Let it go. No. You say you'll be careful. I let go. I'll be careful. Kiss me. Hurry. Somebody there? Somebody. Petey? Hey. Pete Maxwell? Hi, kid. Good evening. This is Crime Classics. I am Thomas Highland with another true story of crime. Listen. The glass you just heard broken was not ordinary glass. It was a closed vessel of exact contour of the man's head which it held. It was raised exactly one millimeter above the skin all around and above the hair. No small feat since the hair on the head was lush and curly. Another masterpiece by Dom Llewellyn, whose secret of blowing glass to enclose human heads died when he died. Dom Llewellyn had been called in to do a job of work on what was left of Mr. John Hayes, which was all above the neck. So tonight, my report to you on John Hayes, his head, and how they were parted. Crime Classics a series of true crime stories from the records and newspapers of every land from every time. Your host each week, Mr. Thomas Highland, connoisseur of crime, student of violence, and teller of murders. Now, once again, Mr. Thomas Highland. The 18th century was only a few years old, and the town was Warwick, and the season was spring. Things were budding all around, trees, flowers, and there happened to be a 16-year-old girl named Catherine Hall. She appears suddenly in history, this girl walking down the road. Suddenly, because nobody knows what parentage put her there. Isn't that nice? A young girl swinging down a road in May. Tra-la-la-la-la-la-la-la-la-la-la-la-la-la-la-la-la-la-la-la-la-la-la-la-la-la-la-la-la-la-la-la-la-la-la-la-la-la-la-la-la-la-la-la-la-la-la-la-la-
at a crossroad. Catherine? Yes, Uncle? Uncle Fred and Uncle Ned and I think the time has come... For what, Uncle? The time has come... Do not be shy. How is it that always you are shy when the sun shines? We have a wedding gift for you. Uncle? From all of us to you. Uncles? The gift, here. A scarf. Uncles? We'll miss you. And I you. And the time now to tell you of him, of the man you will marry... Of the man who comes down this road and on to take you from us, from Uncle Fred and Uncle Ned and myself. Is he as tall as you? He is very rich. Is he as handsome as Uncle Ned? He is very rich. And has he the strength of Uncle Fred? He is very rich. But I know I shall love him well. Catherine? Yes, Uncle. Your duties as wife? Yes, Uncle. Always water in the pail, and loving nuptials cannot fail. And? Happy marriage in a springtime day, child in the cradle on New Year's Day. Oh, yes, Uncle. Oh, yes, Uncle. Ah, he is prompt. I die with impatience. He has a fine span of horses, see? How oh, trembling. Oh, John Hayes! Oh! You, girl. If your name be Catherine, get in. Uncle? Get in, girl, get in. A kiss, Uncle, for farewell to you and Uncle Ned. Which we did in tears and kisses the whole night past. Get in, girl, get in. Here's your money, Lieutenant. Small sackful, as was contracted for. Giddy up. married that night, these impetuous 18th century lovers, these young people, Catherine Hall and John Hayes. History records that it was a rather hectic marriage. Uh, the groom's father went temporarily blind from drink before the ceremony. Uh, there was unruliness among the servants, and some sources state that the bride herself tried to sneak off and had to be restrained. But married they were just as evening sun went down. And that evening, after the house of John Hayes had quieted down, after the pig had been eaten and the toast drunk, after the celebrants had gone home and the windows bolted and the doors barred, after all these things... <laughs> there you are! There you are! Come on out now! <laughs> there you are! Liberty bird. You know what you ought to do. <sighs> what? Join the army. Join the army? Join the army. Why should I do that? Oh, I'd be so proud of you. <laughs> Aren't you proud of me now? Think of you in a uniform. Oh, I, I never did. Well, then let's do it. Uh, all right. The scarlet trousers and the scarlet coat. Oh, my. And the golden sash and the gleaming scabbard. And I'd stand up straight like this. On your curly hair, a three-cornered hat and a cockade. And I'd march. And I'd march. And perhaps... Uh, what? They'd send you to America. Yes! No. You could volunteer for it. Oh, no. You'd miss me too much. You'd suffer. Oh, I'd write to you every day. Well, the boats to America do not sail very often. I'd knit things for you and bake things for you, but mostly... What? I'd be proud, oh, so proud, dear John. Well, I don't know. I... Join the army. <laughs> proud? Oh, yes. What would you do? Well, tell people. Uh, John? Yes? Golden sash and gleaming scabbard, and on your head a three-cornered hat with a cockade, John. And you'd march so straight and tall, you'd march. Um, like this? Yes. Like this? Yes. Oh, yes. Dear father, 
I am writing this letter to tell you that I have just come back from a 20-mile march under full pack, and I do not like it. In the six months I have been in the army, I have not found a thing that I like about it. It is march, 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 march. In spite of my education, I am still but a grenadier. Two of the lads who joined the army with me are lieutenants and wear cockades, so please... Dear Father, present the government with 20 pounds and secure my release from this life. I would do it with my own funds, but I had wisdom enough to assign my wealth to my wife's name before joining the army. I do not wish to bother Catherine in this matter, as I am going to surprise her by my appearance in civilian garb and put an end to her loneliness. Please, Father, do me this favor, your loving son, John. Oh, P.S., Please, Father, just consider it alone. <laughs> that curious tailor from Tottenham. <laughs> Mr. Wood, you're the one. And how about me? Oh, you're a one too, Mr. Billings. You're... If it's the butcher boy, Mr. Wood. Yeah, I'll send him on his way. Hi. Right. Who are you? Well, who are you? I am John Hayes. Who? John Hayes. Oh, you be in the army. Oh, not now. I am John Hayes and I've come home to my wife. Where is she? Uh, Catherine! Who is it? Catherine! Catherine, I'm home! Dirty deserter! No! Oh, shame! Oh, listen, I'm out of the army! But you cannot be! I just sent you a sweater! I'm out! M my father paid a bounty for me and I'm home again. Who are these men, Catherine? I'm, uh, Billings, the cooper. I be Wood. The alehouseman. Tradesman? Aye. Well, what do we need a cooper and an alehouseman here? Are you questioning me, husband? Well, I'd like to know why a cooper and an alehouseman... Welcome home. Aye, welcome home. <laughs> Ready here. Come to home. Drink a cheer, boys. Run to here, oh, come to home. <laughs> Ready here, oh, come to home. <laughs> come to home. <laughs> come to home. <laughs> come to home. <laughs> Uh, oh, husband. Oh, dear wife. I was so proud of you when you were gone. And you told people. Oh, yes. Drink a cheer. Here. Drink a cheer. <laughs> and now, wife. We will celebrate you and me and Mr. Billings and Mr. Wood. Well, I Happy thought. Good. We'll have a celebrate. John, you're dusty from the road. Go wash. There's a full pail, always a full pail, always waiting for your return. Go wash. Uh, uh, yes. Mr. Wood. Hi, Katie. Mr. Billings. How did you come to marry such a one, Kate? He's very rich. And he's come home. His wealth is assigned in my name. I receive it but in driblets. Mm, poor lady, shame. If I were a widow... The money? All at once. All mine. Billings? Aye? Let's make a widow. And uh, how to do that? You kill an husband, you make a widow. <sighs> Ain't that an axe above the fireplace? Oh, dear friends. I washed Catherine. I was proud. Ruddy hero. A soldier had come home to his wife, to his neighbors. There was wine in the room and a good fire. But it was one of the shortest celebrations on record.
are listening to Crime Classics and your host, Thomas Highland. This Saturday night, learn the true details of the Wheel of Misfortune case on Gangbusters, when a wheel, gangland terminology for a driver in a crime, runs afoul of the law, he cuts himself out of the crime in question. After the robbery comes off, the wheel declares himself in for a cut of the spoils and murder results before police clamp the lid on the crooks. Gangbusters, this Saturday night on most of these same stations. The same evening to listen for CBS Radio's thrilling Gunsmoke series. And now once again, Thomas Highland and the second act of Crime Classics and his report to you on John Hayes, his head, and how they were parted. Historical background. We are concerned here with England in the early 1700s. George I sat upon the throne, and the terms Whig and Tory were being muttered and bandied about and chalked on walls. During one February, the great Sir Hugh Burdenny took time away from the Navy, went ashore long enough to invent the side pocket, only to die a year later in the Fijis. And in April, a month which concerns us most, King George put his queen in prison because of her part in the von Königsmark affair. But we are concerned most with a citizen of the time, Mr. John Hayes. We hear of him next on the evening of April 22nd. Two lovers who had never heard of him strolled along the Thames. Stroll. Let's sit here, Duck. No, Thomas. So they strolled on. Mary. Duck. Let's sit here. Oh, no. And on. I like it here beneath the bridge, don't you? Well... See how the shadows lie like lacy web? Where? Yon. Oh. Let us sit and watch and see how they quiver as riding moon, a trail in the sky. Here? Just so. Mary, duck, you are dear to me. Hush. And how to wash this torrent inside me. Fair Mary, fairest and most lovely. And now the blushes to your cheek beneath the moon. Thomas. Yes, Mary. I too. Thomas. This is an unreality which we see, Mary. A conjugation of shadow and moonlight and... But it has such curly hair. Lacy shadows. And eyes and lips that grin. A head with no body. There in the mud. It'll go away. How can it? It's an abomination. Come... It's not real. It is real. It is not. Go see. Duck. Go see. All right. Well? Go. A head? Of a man? Of a curly-headed man. I knew it. Thomas Ascot, I did not want to come down here in the first place. You made me. You made me. A head? Go. So they discovered the head in the mud of the Thames. And after they married, they had a lot to talk about. It was the head of John Hayes, all right, but nobody knew it then. Thomas Ascot reported his unusual find to the constabulary, who went to the spot, saw that the lad was indeed a truthful lad, poked about searching for a body to go with the head, failed, and then brought back what had been found to the sheriff's offices. They cleaned and combed the find, known as dressing the head in the trade. Then they mounted it neatly on a ten-foot pole. This was the custom of the day. Whenever an extra head was found, mounted on a pole, exhibited in the town square so it could be identified. 
Nobody, however, came forward in the prescribed three days, so Dom Llewellyn was called in. Uh, do that thing you do with glass, Dom, he was told, uh, with heads, and close this one for preservation purposes. And Dom did, with caliper and a secretly fashioned glass and blowpipe. And Tom did. In the meanwhile, back at the home of Catherine Hayes, she's just stepped out of her door on her way to the cheese stall. Mrs. Hayes! <coughs> Mrs. Hayes! Good morning to you, Mrs. Martin. Good morning to you. A marketing? A marketing. Mind you if I go along, if I walk with you. Neighbor who walks alone, neighbor's alone. Aye. Wise was the poet who first said that. Mrs. Hayes. Yes? A question. Ninny do. How go your two boarders? A pace. So? Yes. Mr. Wood is an attractive one. Wouldn't you say? In truth, I had not noticed. Nonny, nonny, nonny. In truth? I suppose you'll say you have not noticed the prettiness of Mr. Billings. Not at all. Through the goodness of my heart for poor tradesmen, they live in my cellar. Truth, I never see them. And Mr. Hayes, your husband. Of him what? I have not seen him. I heard he has returned from the army, but I have not seen him. No wonder. No wonder? If he is on his way to Portugal, how could you see him? How indeed. But Mrs. Hayes. Yes? So long he was in the army. Then home to such a young and comely as you... Then within four days, he offs to Portugal. Oh, restless, John. My last words to him as he left. Restless indeed. Huh. Would that my husband were restless like that and off to Portugal. And a cooper like that Mr. Billings about. Some has all the looky. Mrs. Martin shook her head sadly all the way to the cheese stalls. There, she selected a good round edam and went home and told all the neighbors that John Hayes had hied off to Portugal. And neighbors told neighbors, and everybody was satisfied. For a week. For it was a week later that Mrs. Martin went down to London on a visit to a friend. It was an infrequent trip for Mrs. Martin, and her friend took her around to show her the sights the finest statuary, the best inns, and on a Sunday afternoon, he took her to see a head which had been encapsulated by Dom Llewellyn and which was on exhibition at the Constabulary Museum. And seeing it, Mrs. Martin said this. Why, well, I do believe I know that man. And her friend took her to the sheriff to whom she repeated herself. Well, I do believe I know that man. What man? Why, the man in that room there, the one whose head's in the glass. You know him, you say? Did he? You're certain? Did he? Did he do? Who is he? A neighbor to me, husband to a young lass, poor lass. Ah? Poor lass, barely 17, I'd say, and her husband dead in such a way. Who is she? What's her name? Catherine. Catherine Hayes. And he who you've got like you've got, is her hobby, dear, John Hayes. I'll be confused, I'll be. How? What's he doing in that room, like he is, when he's in Portugal? What's he doing there, indeed? Madam. I. Will you take me to your neighbor? Deedee. Deedee, I will. <laughs> Me, ale house man. I'd as soon slit your gullet as look at you. And I'll do it if you don't leave us alone. Talking. That's all you're good at, Billings. 
Come to me so I can let the air out of you with a knife. I I'm between you. Yes, who be you? Sheriff of London Town. For what? If you be Mrs. John Hayes, I come to take you with me. For what? To show you of your husband, if he be the one whose head we have. Head? Aye. And, madam? Aye. The two men I espy over your shoulder, may I inquire of their worth? Friends to me. And your husband? I would say so. We will all ride down to London Town. And now, Mr. Wood, I will show you a thing. Come with me. Look, you. <gasps> Who is this man whose head is in this glass? I do not know. Who is this man? I do not know. I swear it. I am a pious man. And when I swear a thing, it is sworn to. And it is the truth. Very well. Sit there. Mr. Billings? Close the door, please. Walk to that table, Mr. Billings, and tell me whose head it is in case there. Mr. Billings? Aye. What have you done with the rest of Mr. Hayes? Mr. Hayes? Did you put an axe in such a way as to sever his head? Me? You. No. Very well. Sit there. Mrs. Hayes, please. Is that your husband's head who is on the table? No. You are not looking at the head, Mrs. Hayes. Nor do I need to. For my beloved husband, my strength and my love is in Portugal. Mrs. Hayes. What? Will you look at the head, please? I will not. I will bring it to you so you can see. Do not. For what reason? Do not. Do not. Oh, do not. Do not. How can it be my hubby loved John when he is in... <gasps> Pretend, Mrs. Hayes. Pretend he is not in Portugal, and so pretending tell me, is this your husband? No. Are you sure? It is not my husband. Perhaps you need a better look. No, no, it is not John, not him. I hold him by the hair and close to you. Now tell me. John, John, hubby love. Your husband. Yes, yes, oh, yes. And how got he here? They, they did it, Billings and Wood. Say, liar! No shame and no lies. You, the two of you evil men, killed him and severed his head. I, while you fetched the pail to catch his head. And laughed as you caught it. In the name of his majesty, I charge the three of you. Charge them, not me. The three of you. And the three of them were tried. Billings and Wood on the charge of murder. Catherine on the charge of petty treason, which was 18th century talk for killing one's husband. All were found guilty. Wood died in jail. Billings was hung in chains. And Catherine... Let me read to you from a journal of the times concerning Catherine. An iron chain was placed about her body and fixed to a stake. On these occasions, when women were burned for petty treason, it was customary to strangle them by means of a rope passed round the neck and pulled by the executioner, so that they were dead before the flames reached the body. 
but the flames leaped so high that the executioner burned his hands so that he could not strangle, so that Catherine Hayes was burned alive. It is interesting to note that a graph of petty treason in England for a whole year after that shows a decided drop before it picks up again. <laughs> 